Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is Barb, and I'm a very grateful Al-Anon. I am a, a native Atlantan. My home group is currently in Powder Springs, Georgia, the Macklin Serenity Al-Anon family group. Um, my anniversary in the Al-Anon Fellowship is March 19, 1984, and my sponsor since um, 1992 has been Ruth F., and uh, she is 90, uh, and she has not been doing very well, so while I still officially call her sponsor, my, my spon- true sponsor today is Linda B. from St. Paul, Minnesota. And it's very wonderful to be with y'all. I want to be sure and thank um, Jimmy and Mary Beth for inviting Dick and I to be with you this weekend. And I want to thank Jerry for picking us up at the airport and Lorraine for being my host. And um, for the beautiful uh, food basket in our room and uh, the gift that Dick and I both received. Uh, It is a special thing that we're able to um, be gentle and loving and caring with each other in this fellowship, and I thank you. I thank all of you for coming. Um, Arriving in Eatontown yesterday reminded me of a forgiveness story uh, that I thought I would share with, to start with. Um, Dick and I, our youngest child, we call him, um, John, who we affectionately call Santa C, because he is a Santa Claus, um, was Santa here in Eatontown for two years. And... um, uh, he picked Eatontown because when he first got sober, he heard a man named Alan Gallagher, who I believe was from around this area, speak, and he remembered Alan. And uh, he was given several choices of places to go, and uh, he chose Eatontown solely because he'd heard Alan speak. Um, when John had gotten, when he was in the worst of his alcoholism, um, he was separated from his children, and after he got sober and the divorce uh, case, he was told he could never see his children again. And it caused John a lot of pain. He never really knew whether he would ever see them again. And um, he was Santa at the uh, Monmouth Mall, and uh, a woman came uh, and sat on his lap, and uh, she said, um, um, he, he asked her, he said, what's your name, uh, young lady? And he said, you know who, what my name is, Daddy. And it was, it was his daughter. And... Um, they were reuni- reunited here in Eatontown. Um, he had not seen her in 28 years. And um, John called us as soon as his shift was over, and he was crying, and Dick and I were crying, and just remembering what a wonderful fellowship this is. His sponsor had once told him that if he was the man that he was supposed to be, that his children would seek him out, and it happened here. Um, And a year later, he came back to be Santa again, and his daughter brought his granddaughter. So, um, a forgiveness story in Eatontown. Um, I'm honored to be talking with you about my journey and about the things that I have learned um, regarding family forgiveness. Um, I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind, to just join me in a moment of prayer that I can share with you in a spirit of forgiveness and, um, and that you will... Hopefully have that spirit with me. Take just a moment. Thank you. Um, my, you know, in Al-Anon, we don't really use that word codependency that often because it has so many definitions. But my 50 cent definition of it is focusing on someone else so I don't have to look at myself. And um, some of you have some family members that are really good at doing that. Um, You know, I think so many times we come into Al-Anon and we're looking at the alcoholic. We're looking at what has happened to our relationship because of you, and we don't look at ourselves. And what I found in the Al-Anon Fellowship is that it's absolutely, unequivocally required that I look at myself and not you for me to get well. Um, I've often heard it said that when um, al are getting ready to die, that your lives flash in front of our faces. And, uh, <laughs> and 
and I have uh, found that that's probably not the best thing for me, you know. Um, and gratefully, through this program, I actually have my own life and my own feelings and my own experiences, and I have been able to share those. Um, I do, however, as I'm starting today, want to share with you my 12 steps before al Number one, I discovered that I was powerful over others and that your lives were certainly unmanageable. Two, came to believe that I was the power that could restore you to sanity. Three, made a decision for you to turn your will and your life over to the care of me. Four, made a searching and fear-filled inventory of everyone that I knew and found them lacking. Five, admitted to God, myself, and anyone that would listen the exact nature of your wrong. Six, became entirely ready to assist you in removing all your defects of character. (laughs) Humbly, huh? Assisted you in removing your defects of character, except when to do so would cause me harm. Eight, made a list of all people that had harmed me and vowed to get even with them all. Nine, waited and waited and waited and waited for everyone to make direct amends to me. Ten, continued to take your inventory, and when you were wrong, promptly pointed it out. (laughs) Eleven, sought through martyrdom, mothering, managing, and manipulating to improve your conscious contact with me. (laughs) Asking only that you read my mind and carry out my wishes. (laughs) And twelve, Having had a complete emotional, physical, and spiritual breakdown as a result of this type of living, I tried to drag all those I loved down with me and get sympathy and pity from all who would listen. What's sad is that was pretty much true. (laughs) You know, allies may be... Um, I really believe we're as sick as the alcoholics when we come into this room. Sometimes I think we're even sicker because uh, we don't have an excuse, you know. When I came into the rooms of Al-Anon, I was uh, spiritually bankrupt. I was physically ill. I had ulcers. I had intestinal problems. I had severe asthma. I had an active eating disorder. I was... um, severely depressed. I was suicidal half the time, yet nobody ever knew that because I always had a smile on my face. I was ready there to be there for you, to help you, to fix you, to do whatever I could for you, and I denied anything about myself. Um, I really didn't even have my own emotions when I came into Al-Anon. I felt yours. If you were happy, I was happy. If you were sad, I was sad. If you liked somebody, I liked them too. If you hated somebody, hey, I'd jump on the bandwagon with you. And in the process of working this program, for me, I've found me. And that's the true blessing of this program. Um, uh, As I was preparing um, to share with you, um, I uh, thought of a a little forgiveness test that I give myself from time to time uh, in a 10-step kind of way and uh, that I share with my sponsees. And I want to share it with you because it might bring something or somebody to mind as I'm sharing, and it might help you. Do you have someone you wish who would forgive you who has never forgiven you? Are you struggling with forgiving someone in your life? Have you done your step work and done as much as you can, but still have someone in your life you're struggling to forgive? Have you spent any sleepless nights Occupied with thinking about someone in your life, pain of somebody in your life. You know, I, um, I know that there's a couple names came to mind for me when I was looking at those questions. And if they did for you, I hope that something that I share with you uh, in the next hour can help. Um, I'm actually, in addition to being Al Anon, uh, now in my 28th year, I'm actually also an ordained minister. And I have worked in the field of addiction treatment for over 24 years now. 
I actually work for a New Jersey company, so I feel right at home. I work for uh, a treatment center that's in Blairtown, New Jersey. And um, I'm very honored to be working for them. I have been for about three years now. Um, but I can tell you that the most important thing that I'm going to share with you today is my own story. Um, when, I, when I think about the process of the 12 steps, you know, why do we work this 12 steps? The ultimate goal of the 12 steps really is forgiveness. You know, it's restoration of relationships. And if we're actually able to walk through the whole process, that's the, the blessing that we have, that we have people back in our lives. And I know that's been true for me. Uh, I recently heard a minister speak, and he said, towards the end of the service, he asked, uh, it, was there how many people in the, in the audience had actually been able to forgive their enemies? And uh, almost 80% of the people in the room raised their hand. And he said, how many of you, how many of the rest of you would like to be able to forgive your enemies? And by the time that was over, everybody had raised their hand but one woman. And so he asked Mrs. Jones, he said, Mrs. Jones, um, do you not want, you know, do you not want to forgive your enemies? And she said, well, I don't have any. And he said, how could you, you know, how old are you? How could you not have any enemies? And she said she was 96 years old. And so he asked her to come down, and um, uh, he wanted her to share with the, the you know, the, the audience there what the, the, her wisdom was, that she had had no enemies. And um, she got down and very sweetly said, um, all those witches are dead. <laughs> so... Um, you know, and, I, and honestly, some, you know, even sometimes when people are dead, <laughs> we uh, still have some resentment that we need to look at. We've already prayed it today. And I imagine we'll pray it a bunch of times before the day's out. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's our job to forgive first. You know, and, and that's not always easy, you know. Um, but the, what I have found in the process of forgiveness, making our amends and making our part, and sometimes we're out in the middle of the street, cleaning our side of the street only, and standing in, in horrible traffic, waiting for the other person to come to the middle. And sometimes they don't come. But the miracle is when they do. Um, I, uh, I want to share with you a little bit about my own story so you'll understand a little bit about my journey in forgiveness. I came from a long line of alcoholics. Um, my mother's uh, and my father's father uh, both had uh, alcoholism. My dad's father, my dad was a baby of 14 kids. And um, when my dad was seven years old, his father tried to commit suicide, and his mother had him put in the North Carolina State Mental Institution. And my grandfather was there five years and died in the mental institution. And my father could barely remember what his father looked like, so he snuck into the funeral home, and he saw a man with both arms and both legs broken, and the body was black and blue. And uh, my dad didn't understand it, but that was what had happened to his, his father, my grandfather. And um, I did some research and found out that at that point in the mental institutions in North Carolina, they were trying to shock alcoholism out of somebody by breaking a limb. Now, and that's what happened to my grandfather just two generations ago. Now, I'm not saying that there's no Al-Anons in here that may have wanted to break somebody's limb as someone would or other, but, you know, we, we know it's not really going to help you. Um, but that's what happened to my grandfather. My, my mother's mother and father were both alcoholic. Um, my mother's father um, came from a family of great wealth, actually, and I think that I didn't know this until I'd been in Al-Anon for a while because I would have been resentful. But um, uh, my great-grandfather gave all of his kids some money and said, make something of it and you get some more, make nothing out of it and you get nothing. So my grandfather was alcoholic and he went through all the money and squandered it all, was written out of the will, and when he died, he was actually buried in a pauper's grave. Later, my mother and her uh, brother and sister found the grave and moved him and reburied him. Um, my, mother's mother, my mother's sister and brother were alcoholic, and I'm not sure about her. I, I kind of think that she probably was, although once she met, met Dick, she never drank again. I'm not sure what that's about. But <laughs> um, 
Anyway, but my mother's mother was the alcoholic I knew most growing up. I spent every weekend with my grandmother. And I had these two adult children of alcoholics who had no idea how to be parents because they hadn't been parented all that well. And they wanted to spend time together, and so they left me with grandmother. And my grandmother and I, every Saturday morning, our first errand of the day was to go to the liquor store. Now, we didn't go to just one. We went to three. And she would tell me that she was bargain shopping, but I don't think she even wanted any of the liquor store owners to know just how much she bought. So we would make the rounds of the liquor stores, and it was probably illegal in Atlanta back then too, but the liquor store owners would take me behind the counter, and they'd talk to me or give me a toy or some candy while my grandmother did her shopping. And we'd, you know, load the trunk with liquor and um, usually a loaf of bread and some cheese. That's the only thing I ever remember actually eating at my grandmother's. And then we would be off to lunch. We'd go to some fine ladies' place for lunch, tea houses. Atlanta has lots of little little ladies' tea houses. And she would have her three martini lunch, and I would have my three Shirley Temple lunch. And uh, then we would be off on the afternoon with some kind of interesting errand. My grandmother was a very creative alcoholic. She could find drinks, you know, wherever we went. She'd go get her hair fixed, and she would get her hair fixed at a place that would serve her a glass of wine or two. Um, we would go to um, a couple of the fine dress shops in downtown Atlanta. One of them was called Regenstein's, and they would bring her a glass of wine or two to drink while she was there. I actually didn't realize completely what was going on until I learned some of this from my, um, my AA women friends in Atlanta. They let me know just how creative my grandmother had been. Uh, we would go to the symphony, which had an open bar, or we'd go to an art opening, which would have an open bar, or we would go to see a Broadway show when it was traveling through town. And I thought she was just very cultural. But um, (laughs) we would come back and we would unpack the trunk of liquor at her house and I would fix my cheese toast, or sometimes she would, and I'd settle down to eat it and she would settle down with her martini glass and we would watch Lawrence Welk. And somewhere during the middle of Lawrence Welk, probably during the accordion solo or something, um, she would fall asleep. And uh, today I know she passed out, but I didn't understand it back then. And so many a Saturday night I was hurt or sick or tired or scared, and I didn't have anybody to take care of me. When Dick and I first started dating, he asked me if I had any alcoholism in my life, and I told him no. I didn't know that was alcoholism. In Al-Anon's book, From Survival to Recovery, Going Up in an Alcoholic Home, it says that out. Um, the families of alcoholics have an abnormal understanding of alcoholism. We think our life is like everyone else's, so we have no idea that what we're dealing with is alcoholism. Many a Saturday night, grandmother would wake me back up later on, and we would go out to honky-tonks. Now, these were not the fine ladies' establishments. These were dirt or concrete sawdust-covered floor places, and she would be um, partying above me while I would try to sleep on a wet, beer-soaked floor, sometime dirt floor. Um, but I didn't think my life had been affected by alcoholism. Uh, I can tell you that as soon as I found excuses not to go to grandmother's on the weekend, I I didn't. And I would um, find any and every excuse that I could. I grew up terrified of alcohol. I would have told you back then that it had to do um, with um, my religious upbringing because I was Southern Baptist, Um, but I uh, truly just was terrified to be around alcohol because of what it experienced to me. I was pretty socially anorexic, I called myself in, in uh, high school. I, I didn't had three dates in all of high school, and those were events where I had to have an escort and I had to ask a guy to take me. So I uh, graduated from high school and I went off to college. I went to a small um, church college, and um, the first uh, guy that asked me out uh, took me out to church, and on the way home, he uh, pulled over and he started telling me about his life, how his uh, father was alcoholic and had been hidden away in this um, in this church and uh, in this church school. And he started sobbing, and I was automatically in love. <laughs> you know, here was somebody who needed me. I could fix him, and um, uh, what I didn't realize it was probably unfixable was that he was also gay, and it took him a while to tell me that. (laughs) Now, I was 
a good little Baptist girl in the 70s and when nobody was out of the closet. And um, I would like to tell you that only happened to me once, but, um, you know, I probably could have founded Gayanon at some point, but um, anyway, um, I, lo- I love gay men today, but I do know that I can't change them. Anyway, um, um, I uh, went off to seminary to change the world, and um, uh, I, I, there was Joan of Arc and Barbara the Baptist, and um, I, uh, my first semester in seminary, I uh, was playing the piano and uh, leading the youth choirs in this church, and on a Saturday, Sunday night, a man came in and asked to make amends to the church and got up and told a little bit about his story and um, asked if he could stay around uh, to make amends uh, in that church for a while. And that man is going to speak to you on step 12 tomorrow. Um, Now, it wasn't quite that simple. Um, Dick asked me out during that time, and I turned him down because I was dating somebody else in the church at the time who ended up to be gay. And... uh, (laughs) I think that I was probably a little too naive for Dick, and I don't think he was quite sober enough, so I think God knew what he was doing back then. So um, we ran back to each other, into each other in Atlanta after I had graduated from seminary, and he came up to me and asked me if I had, um, um, you know, if I, that he knew he, had knew, he knew he had met me from somewhere, uh, and I didn't remember him. Now, the first time I met Dick, he had hair, but... Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, we eventually did realize we'd met at this church, and um, I finally agreed to go out with them. And a lot had happened to me in the interim. And, um, and the, I'm going to focus on that part because I really is part, the biggest part of my forgiveness story. I went to seminary during a time that women were becoming less and less important in the denomination I had chosen to serve. And a month before I graduated... That denomination passed a resolution that Eve was the first to sin, and therefore women should not lead over men, and women in ministry would strongly be discouraged. So I graduated after spending seven years of education to feeling like God didn't want me. And I didn't really know that it had settled into my soul that way for a long time. I felt God had rejected me. So when I ran back into Dick and when we went out, uh, we went out two or three times. Uh, and the first time we went out to a Broadway play in a four-star restaurant, and the second time we went out to an equally nice restaurant in a movie. And the third date, Dick took me out for a Johnny Mathis concert under the stars at this outdoor amphitheater in Atlanta, and he had a catered dinner brought in. And that night, he told me about this prayer that he'd prayed way back when I was in seminary. He'd seen me up in the choir loft one day, and he prayer, and his sponsor told him he could go out if he could find anybody to go out with him. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, I should be careful, he is going to speak after me. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he prayed this very eloquent prayer, God, she do. And... Uh, <laughs> So he told me about this prayer, and he thought, he said, I know that we're destined to be together, that God's ordained us to be together. And, and by that time, I was very cynical. I didn't believe, I didn't even know if I believed in God sometime. I'd been so rejected, you know. And I said, I don't, I don't think God works that way. And I, besides, I'm not sure I'm even attracted to you. And I, by that time, I told him enough about me that he said he didn't think I knew what to do with a heterosexual, but, um, <laughs> which was probably true. But uh, anyway, so we didn't date for a while. And during that time, I had, uh, after, I had had all these interviews um, looking for a job when I got out of seminary. One of them, I had gone uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, down to this little church in Alabama, and, you know, alcoholics have brownouts. I have brown, I have blackouts. I have brownouts. When I really resent somebody or something traumatic happens in my life, my brain kind of seals it over, and I don't remember all of it. So I can't tell you what town in Alabama, I can't tell you the name of the church, and I don't remember what anybody looked like in the room. 
But I had walked into this interview, and there was a circle of about 50 chairs and one in the middle, and they'd escorted me in. I'd driven all the way down there. They escorted me in. They had me sit in the chair. And a man that was sitting across from me looked at me and said, we just wanted to see what someone like you, a woman, that would have the audacity to apply for this job would look like. That's all. And I didn't know what to say. Now, I've thought of several things since then. But um, <laughs> I, um, the words that came out of my mouth were, I hope you're going to pay for my expenses. And so from this part of the circle, a man threw some money on the floor. And I picked up the money, and I walked out of the circle, and that had become God. You know, it's hard to work this program if you resent God. It's hard to work the program. And so, you know, Dick, Dick and I, I, I recognized uh, after a little while that I probably made a mistake, and we started going out. During the interim time, I, I did check and be sure all the gay guys were still gay, but... Um, anyway, and Dick and I started going out, and um, um, we decided to get married. Now, during that period of time, he told me he wouldn't marry anybody unless they were now and on. And um, so I started going to manipulate him into marrying me. I didn't really go. I mean, however you get to al you can get well, which is good news. So um, I started going to al and I did what I called my um, Cliff Notes version of al I tried to learn all the buzzwords and uh, try to make him think I was working a good program when really I was just arriving during the, you know, the prayer and leaving during the second prayer so nobody would really talk to me. And, um, but I started going. Also during that time, when I got out of seminary, I came back to Atlanta and I was the assistant director of the education division of this denomination. And um, important job. And I had been called in and told that... Um, they were having to get rid of any women in management positions because they couldn't keep any women uh, in those jobs. Now, with separation of church and state, there was nothing I could do about it. Um, so again, that rejection. So what did I do? I got married. And um, so um, I started working for Dick, and all those things had just poisoned my system. I didn't really, and again, I didn't see that it happened. Um, Dick and I went to Montreal in 1985 to the International Convention, and we got on this plane. It was an L-1011, and um, there were, somebody made an announcement, is there any friends of Bill W. on the plane? And there was over 100 people. And Dick was so excited. He was, I could just imagine what he was like when he was table hopping, when he was drinking, because he was jumping all over the plane, talking to people. He was so excited. And I had never felt more like I didn't fit in. So if there's anybody in this room today that's feeling like that, I've been in your shoes. Okay? You don't have to stay there. That's the good news. And so, um, you know, he was excited and he was introducing me to people and I didn't know any of them. And we got to Montreal and we, you know, we registered and people were hugging us on the, in the, um, on the streets. Now, if you've ever met a new Al-Anon, sometimes they're not quite sure whether they want to be hugged. Have you ever experienced that? Well, that's kind of where I was at the time. And um, that night, um, I had I had tried a lot. Dick had gone to a lot of open Al-Anon meetings. I'm so glad that so many of y'all are in here. Um, had gone to a lot of open Al-Anon speaker meetings and had learned a lot about what Al-Anons try that doesn't work. And so um, I couldn't do anything to manipulate him. You know, the first... Uh, two or three years that we were married, I kept a bag packed all the time, and I would ceremoniously announce that I was going to leave him, and I would go, and I would get the bag out of the, out of the closet, and I'm saying, I'm going to go, and he said, I understand. <laughs> and I would go, and I'd walk over to the door, and I'd say, you really understand I'm going? He said, I got it. And so I'd walk through the door, and then I'd stick my head back in. You do go, you don't do understand I'm leaving. Oh, yes, I do. And so I get down to the car, and in my fantasy, I'd probably watch too many soap operas and read too many romance novels, I would imagine him running down the stairs and say, oh, beloved, don't go, and he never did do it. So I'd have to go somewhere. I'd go ride around the block for an hour or two. I'd go see my parents. Now, I wouldn't tell them that we were arguing because I didn't want them to know we weren't doing well. And, um, and probably two or three hours later, I'd come home with my bag, and I'd say, hey, and he'd say, good to see you again. I'd put the bag up. Now, I would like to tell you I only did this once. 
I don't even know how many times I did it. And, you know, at that time, I thought Dick was well because he was six and a half years sober, and he thought I was well because I had no alcoholism in my life. I think he was in more denial. So um, anyway, we got to Montreal, and this was the ultimate. I went, came out of the bathroom with a razor in my hand and told him I thought that I was going to commit suicide. Now, the truth is, is I was that hopeless. Um, the reality of the reaction I got was that he started laughing at me. Now, before you think he's too cruel, because he is speaking tomorrow, it was one of those pink Vic Daisy razors, and I had been using it for a week or two to shave my legs, so it really wasn't going to hurt myself. But I was that hopeless. So I... um you know, I, I, the only one that's ever been physical, the other, I, I hit him in the gut, and, you know, and I just broke. And he said, honey, if there's ever a time for you to join Al-Anon for you before you actually do kill yourself, it, it might be here. You're at the International Convention. There's meetings 24 hours a day. So the next morning, we went to the opening session of Al-Anon's first international convention that was held in conjunction with AA that year in Montreal. And the opening speaker was Lois Wilson. So when I got ready, I still get goosebumps when I think about it. When I got ready to hear the message of Al-Anon for me, Lois herself was the one that brought it to me. And she talked about the fact that there was not a spiritual side of this program. It was a spiritual program. It was a transforming way of living. We never had to be the same again. By the time I'd left Montreal, I'd finally taken the first step. Now, taking that second and third step was difficult for me. I thought I knew everything about God. I went to seminary, you know. So I kept on thinking I could skip those steps, and it wasn't working. You know, I did a couple of inventories. The first one I actually did on independent study, but that's an, I'll, I don't have time to tell you that story. So um, anyway, I, um, I had a sponsor who told me that I should start keeping a God journal. And I should write down everything that happened in my life that was beyond human understanding. You know, if it was a call when I needed it, if it was a hug in a meeting, if it was money to pay a bill when I didn't see how we were going to be able to pay it, if it was a a sunrise or sunset, if it was a beautiful flower. At that point in my life, if it was the horses uh, that lived behind us, I was supposed to write it down. So I started keeping this God journal. And... um, I started to believe that there was a power greater than me that could restore you to sanity, okay? But I didn't see that that power loved me because I'd been rejected. God didn't want me. I loved speaker meetings from the very beginning. I, would, I just loved them. First speaker I heard was Jack Sullivan, Anna, who had been Dick's sponsor at one point. And when he talked about the fact that, you know, a collection um, – Uh, agent had come and knocked on his cardboard box and told him that he was going to make his life miserable unless he paid his bill, you know. (laughs) I love that story. And then later on, you know, he, God's life transformed him. There had to be a power greater than me to take a man out of a cardboard box and eventually put him in a program where he was helping other people get sober, you know. And so I began to get to see that connection, that God transformed lives. I still wasn't sure that that would happen to me. Um, You know, they say that when, or what my experience is, is when you're stuck in a step and nothing seems to be working quite right, sometimes you have to go to the one before or after it. So I had to do a God inventory to be able to, uh, and do a fourth and fifth step of my relationship with God in the church to get the second and third step. And I looked at all those interviews, and I just shared one with you. There were a lot of them. And I, all those experiences that had happened to me in churches. And, and I went back to my childhood beliefs that God was love. And I, 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 I looked at your experiences. And I started, I inventoried everything. And I began to realize that I needed to get rid of all this. And that what happened to me had nothing to do with God. It had everything to do with people. You know, the difference between religions and spirituality is huge. And uh, there's a lot of people that come to Al-Anon NAA that are spiritually wounded uh, because of religious experiences, and that was certainly me. And God's given me the gift over the years of helping people that have come to that point. 
So, because that's what happened to me. I finally began to believe that God loved me, that that was not God, and I started to let go of that, started to unravel. Um, Dick and I had some financial trouble around that time, and I really believe that it had as much to do with the fact that God wanted to teach me some lessons as uh, anything to do with financial mismanagement. It just happened. But we got to a point, we were both active in the program, we were both active in service, and we got to a point we didn't have money for food, and I was terrified. And I didn't know how to tell anybody. Uh, you know, I was too proud to tell anybody. So I got down on my knees, and um, we had a dog back then named Booger Bear who probably went to more, more conventions than most of you here. And Booger Bear would always pray with me. He'd get down, and he'd put his head on the bed when I'd pray. And um, so we got down. And if you've ever looked at the word dog in the mirror, you know, it's God. So I, t- I learned a lot about unconditional love from my dog. But I got down on my knees and I asked God to forgive, uh, to, to help me. I didn't know what to do. And two hours later, there was a knock on the front door and there was a friend of mine there with um, four, ba- eight bags of groceries. You know, now God may have never delivered groceries to you, but God delivered groceries to me. And that's what it took me uh, to believe that God loved me. And that, be- that transformation began to happen for me. And I began, I forgave God, and I asked God to forgive me. Um, <clears throat> when, when I started to finally work these steps for myself, you know, I had a tremendous amount of self-centered pride. And I would never have been able to tell you that. You know, a friend of mine had given me an old drunk car, and this was an old drunk car. Rusted into the hood was Judy Loves Donnie, Okay. <laughs> And both the taillights in the back had been broken out. And we had, you know, tape over it. And the headliner was kind of hanging down. And there was no air conditioning in it. So I had to roll the windows down. And the dust from the headliner kind of blew out the back window. It was lovely. And um, so I would park it a couple blocks away when I'd go to meetings. And I'd jog to the meeting like I was very healthy. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, you know, when I was able to pull the car into the parking lot, things started changing. That self-centered pride went away. Um, Dick did really, really did not need me to help him work his program. He was six and a half years sober when we got married, and he had never been married either. So he, you know, there were things uh, that just irritated me. But you know, I know, I know people that get divorced over the t- toilet paper, whether it's over or under, or, you know, how you push the toothpaste tube. I mean, silly stuff. Mine was the toilet seat. Now, I'm not going to try to create any arguments in here, but um, I just could not get over the fact he did not respect me enough to put the toilet seat down. And I had mentioned it to my sponsor one too many times, and she said, you have to try something. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, you have to try something. I said, what? She said, no, you have to agree to do it before I tell you what it is. If your sponsor ever tells you this, beware. So... um, (laughs) I said, okay, and she said, you're going to leave the seat up for him. I said, I'm going to do what? She said, you're going to leave the seat up for him. And I said, you're kidding. She said, no, try it. So, you know, I'd go to the bathroom, and I, the first few times I'd throw the seat back up, almost broke the back of the toilet. And, uh, but slowly it became, became funny. You know, I'd come out of the bathroom giggling. I, you know, he'd look at me, but he never really said anything. It took over a month for Dick to say something. And finally he said, have you developed some kind of new unusual bathroom habit? <clears throat> and I said, no, honey, I'm just leaving the seat up for you. And, um, it's, uh, and it really doesn't matter anymore whether it's up or down. I can look, you know. Um, <laughs> but it's just one of those examples of how, you know, it, it was the action of of making amends, of letting something go, of realizing that being mad at him about the toilet seat made no sense at all, you know. And uh, it was the beginning of those, exper- those forgiveness experiences in my life. I had a college roommate na- named Brooke, and um, I had moved out on her while she was at work one day. We would had an argument about a guy at the time. And um, I didn't leave her a note. I didn't leave her a forwarding address. I didn't leave her money for the rent, which was due the next day. I just left. So when I started looking at my need to, to have people forgive me, Brooke was on my list. 
and the phone number I had for her wasn't good, and the phone number for her mother wasn't good, and the college we went to was didn't have her number. I thought I was off the hook. So I was on vacation in a city I'd never been to, and I don't think she'd ever been there either. And I saw her in a mall coming down the other way, and to people tell me this happens when you're supposed to be making amends. Um, and I walked over to her, and I said, I can't believe you're here. I've been trying to find you. I'm in this 12-step fellowship. I know I owe you an amend. I looked in my wallet. I had about the amount of money I thought I probably owed her. And so I gave it to her. I gave her my business card. She never said a word. She just stared at me like this. And so for a minute I wondered if it was her. Um, But it was. And so I gave her the money. I gave her the card. I thought that was it. She never said a word. And about a year later she called me. And she said, Barbara, you'll never know what a gift you gave me that day. I had... So much resentment in my life. I had let so many people in my life go. And your gift to me allowed me to have a restored relationship with my mother and a couple other people in her life. So sometimes when we're able to seek forgiveness, when we're able to make amends, they pay forward. And we don't even know it, you know. Here she she let me know that. She said, you didn't owe me that much money. She sent me some back. And uh, we're on each other's Christmas card list. I haven't seen her again. But we're on each other's Christmas list. What a great, what a great gift. Um, my parents, um, you know, my parents, um, one of, the first thing I started to do to try to make amends with my parents, to try to find forgiveness for them and them for me, was I just started calling them and including them in my life. I'd let them know what was going on when Dick and I were going off on a program weekend. I would tell them we were going. I'd call them when I got there and gave them the phone number wherever it was. Because, you know, there was that point in time I didn't want them to know where I was. You know, so I just included them in my life. And it, it's, I started, if I got a cell phone, I started calling them on the way home from work every day. And, yeah, I got tired of my mother telling me what she was eating for dinner every night. But she looked forward to my call. And we had a restored relationship. And they started to get sick. Um, we started to encourage them to consider um, moving out of their house. They had stairs on all levels of the house and going up and down. They were pretty much housebound. Um, during that time, Dick and I gave them a 50th anniversary um, party, and my mother celebrated 50 an- years in an organization she was in that was kind of like the Yaya Sisterhood. I never really understood it, but she didn't really understand Al-Anon either. So she asked me to give her her pen. You know, we had this party, and finally we convinced my parents that they needed to move. And so we um, moved them out, and we put them in uh, assisted living Beautiful apartment, all new furniture, pictures of everybody they loved all over the all over the war, uh, all over the room, and um, it was in August. And in January, Dick was actually supposed to on his way to Colorado to speak, and um, he got stuck out on the on the tarmac for three hours. And the um, uh, the plane thought they found it was it was like your day yesterday, Ron and Ralph. Okay. Uh, they brought the plane back in and said, we're going to have to find a new plane. Uh, it's going to be another two, three hours. And he was the Friday night speaker, and they, he realized he wasn't going to make it. And so he was home when I got a call that my dad had been found non-responsive and had been rushed to the hospital but hadn't made it. So um, now just a few months earlier than that, my dog, Booger Bear, had died at 18. And Dick and I thought we would never grieve more than that. Um, but, um, we buried him, we cried, we sobbed, um, and he taught me how to grieve just as he taught me everything I needed to know about God's unconditional love. So, um, my dad died. We had a beautiful service. Um, my mother helped her fix herself up and she hadn't put makeup or fixed her hair in a while. Her friends came to be with her. Dick and I went off to an AA weekend on, we decided to stay over a day, and on Monday we were having a shrimp out by the beach in Hilton Head, and we got a call that my mother had been found non-responsive and rushed to the hospital. It didn't look like she was going to make it uh, in a hurry. So we rushed back. Um, I was in shock. Dick was angry because the police pulled him over. I think that um, I think God wanted him to have somebody to be angry with besides him. And um, we got we stopped at a Wendy's. And we went into the Wendy's, and in the Wendy's on the Muzak was playing How Great Thou Art. Now, I've never heard a hymn in a Wendy's before or since. (laughs) So I asked somebody if they heard it too, you know. 
And uh, they said, yeah, and we had just sung that at my dad's service. So God was telling me it was going to be okay. Um, so uh, we got home. We were with my mom, holding her hand. And right in the middle of I will be done, my mom passed away 10 days after my dad. Um, but you know, the blessing of that is I had no unfinished business. The program had given me that gift. You know, that transforming part of the program, the house cleaning steps, four through nine. If you haven't done your work with your family, you never know. You know, and what a gift. I had no, had no um, unfinished business. Um, with my grandmother, I wrote a letter and I went to her grave and I read it there. And I had some potting soil and a, a camellia bush, which was her favorite and mixed it with some potting soil and planted a camellia bush there and uh, watered it with my own tears and some water I brought with me. And every year I try to go to her grave when the camellias bloom because it helped me remember how when I'm able to let something go, something beautiful blooms in its place. Um, the Baptist Church. Okay, I've, oh, I've said it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, um, you know, I continue to pray that God would remove any feelings of resentment I had for everything that happened to me. And I was able to go when my, when my niece was baptized, and I was able to go for weddings, and I just started the, whatever those strains that had held me of any resentment started to go away. And actually this year, uh, Dick and I uh, were in Louisville, Kentucky, and I said, I need to go to my seminary. And he said, do you know what you need to do there? I said, no, I think I'll figure it out when I get there. So we went, we went into the chapel, and I just, I just thanked God for the education that I got in there because without it, I wouldn't have been working in the field of addiction for 24 and a half years. So I have a master's degree that includes counseling, and, and for that I'm very grateful. And I asked God to remove any lingering resentment that I had, and um, it wasn't lightning bolts, but I felt at peace. You know, it was what I needed to do, and I walked out, and as we were walking out of the chapel, there was this security guard that showed up that looked like a SWAT team member. He had a 9-millimeter strap to his thigh. And I thought, it's a seminary? And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm alumni. I just came here to pray. And he looked at me kind of funny, and he said, well, okay. So he followed, his eyes followed us everywhere we went. And I looked way over on the other side of the campus. There was another one. And they were just watching us. And I thought, are they afraid of like a attack of the rejected female seminarians I, i'm not sure what they were looking for i you know it was the weirdest thought you know i thought and you know by the time i left there i didn't feel any resentment i felt a little pity you know that they would be afraid of me you know um anything that was left though was was gone you know and i feel at peace and i know that god has a purpose for me a little over a year ago um actually after two or three incidents I had two friends in the program who wanted me to be with them when they pulled life support on a family member. They knew my background and they wanted me to be with them. And I had another Al-Anon friend ask me to go and do communion with his brother um, right before he was going to have um, surgery at Shepherd Spinal Center in Atlanta. I said, Boots, I'm, I'm not an ordained minister. He said, I don't care. You can do communion with him. And by the way, why aren't you? And so... Um, Last year I was ordained by a non-denominational church. And um, I didn't know at the time while I was doing it, but it was a wonderful, peaceful experience, full circle, to have that happen. And this year I've done three funerals. Now, I can't tell you that this happened because I was supposed to have a gift of funerals. It's, I actually told my sponsees they could marry the wrong person for six months because I'd like to do a wedding. Um, <clears throat> But um, anyway, the first one was the sponsee, and the second one was my mentor, uh, and uh, actually Dick's aftercare counselor when he was in treatment long ago, Tony C. And um, the third one was a friend that I've known that works in the addiction field for many years. And when the first one came around, I was I felt a little in over my league. I thought, now, you know, God, you've given me this opportunity. I've never done a funeral. You know, how do I do this? And so I was standing at the glass window in my bedroom looking out at our lake and just praying um, that God would give me some kind of sign. And a, a 
red-tailed hawk landed on the balcony and stared me right in the eye. And um, five minutes. I mean, hawks don't do this. I don't know if you know this, but they just don't. So I don't know if it was my, my sponsee Karen or if she sent it or, or what, but here was this hawk. And by the time the hawk left, I was sobbing. And I went back in and I Googled, I'm a great Googler, I Googled uh, hawk Native American symbolism. And what I came up with was that a hawk is a messenger of God, encouraging us to rise over the earthly plane and see our lives from a new perspective. And that was the service. How can we see death from a new perspective? How we, can we see our lives from a new perspective? And that's what forgiveness is all about. It's, it allows us to see our lives from a new perspective. And it gives us a transformational way of looking at living. Um, I've learned a lot over the years. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of it because we're going to run out of time. But one of the things that I do know is that there's medical evidence that the lack of forgiveness affects us physically. Um, you know, they've, they've had a, a lot of, sometimes when somebody seems to not have a kind of cancer that's responding to treatment, they send them to work on their spiritual life. You know, and when they're, often when they're able to find forgiveness in their life, they'll go into remission. I've seen it happen. Um, I'm just going to share a couple of these things. The spleen, the spleen, the emotions that affects the spleen most are worry, dwelling on or focusing on some particular topic, resentment, um, or excessive mental work. The spleen function is food digestion, nutrient absorbance, helps in the formation of blood and energy, is connected with muscles, mouth, and lips, involved in thinking, studying, and memory. And the symptoms of spleen imbalance are being tired, loss of appetite, mucus discharge, poor digestion, abdominal distension, loose stools, diarrhea, weak muscles, pale lips, bruising, except, and bleeding disorders. Okay, now, and that's medical evidence that our spleen can be affected by our emotions. And I'm not going to go through all the, but each body of, each organ in your body equally has those types of experiences that our emotions can affect those. So often when people are actually able to finish steps four through nine, not only do we have the promises that are promised in the big book, we get better. You know, that's been my experience. You know, when I had a new job, um, I've been in the job I'm in for two and a half years. In the first six months, I was a little in over my head, and I was so nervous all the time. And I had fear about making cold calls and all this stuff. And my intestinal system was a mess. My doctor tried to put me on, on an antidepressant. I, you know, said, no, no, the steps work for everything. I'm not going to do that. Um, but as I was able to let go of the fear... All those symptoms went away. You know, whenever I have um, intestinal and stomach um, issues going on, Dick, you know, reminds me that I probably have some emotion I'm not handling well, and it's almost always true. Um, So doing this work is worth it in many respects, but it can also help us feel better physically. Um, You Think about uh, how anger happens. You know, it often starts with extreme rage, and then it moves, it cools a little bit, it just becomes anger. And with time, it becomes resentment. And if enough time goes by, and maybe we're doing a little work in the program, but not a whole lot, it kind of times, turns into numbness. You know, maybe your brain, maybe your, your system somehow, they're just kind of walls it off and puts it away and tries not to think about it. But by doing this work, by truly finding acceptance and love for that person, you know, that is the miracle. That's when the miracle happens. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about um, reasons people don't forgive. I've done a lot of his steps over the years, and, and I've helped a lot of people through, through looking at those things. And a lot of young women have had some real abuse happen to them, you know, physical, sexual, emotional abuse. And they cannot bring themselves to even considering forgiving that person. You know, more and more these days I've seen people kind of wear their badge of being an abuse survivor, okay? And what I have found is it's kind of like a phrase, that uh, a quote from Dolly Parton. Um, 
get down off the cross. Somebody needs the wood. Um, I know it really is just not healthy for us to hold on to that abuse. Let it go. You don't have to. You don't have to go hang out with your abuser again. But you're given your power over again to that person who's harmed you if you hold on to it. You know, and I've, I've helped countless people begin to realize that by not forgiving, they're only continuing to hurt themselves and abuse themselves over and over again. Um, sometimes it's I'm waiting for them to make amends first. You know, when they make amends to me, I'll make amends to them. But we're still giving our power away. Um, I know for me, you know, there was a time that I wasn't sure what my life would be like without resentment. It was kind of my motivating factor for living. I've heard a lot of people that say, I'm going to show them I'm going to make something of my life. And so the resentment becomes the motivation for living. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to make it. I'm going to become a powerful whatever it is to show that person that harmed me. Uh, but again, it's only hurting us. Um, there's basically four Ps for not forgiving. The first one, and this is particularly true for family members, but I think it's true for all of us. Um, the first one is power. Okay, If I forgive you, I don't have any power over you anymore. Some of you have somebody who at least thinks they have some power over you. They're manipulating you because they haven't forgiven you yet. You know, you hurt me, and so you have to do this for me. Okay. The next one is protection. You know, there's a lot of people, if you've got somebody in your life, a family member who just won't forgive you, it might be about protecting themselves. You know, they're terrified that if they forgive you, you'll hurt them again. And so they protect themselves and they wall themselves off. And I've done this. I protect myself and walled myself off because I didn't want to be harmed again. Uh, the next one is pride, you know. Waiting for you to go first. Uh, You know, yeah, maybe I'll forgive you, but, you know, I'm not going to do it first. Pride. And the last one is punishment. You've hurt me, and I'm going to hurt you as much as I can, because I am not going to forgive you. And those are the four Ps that I see the most. Um, I want to come back a little bit to those questions I asked you early on. Um, Who have you been unable to forgive? If you've got a name in your mind, you have some work to do. I'm going to be around for the rest of the weekend. I know the other speakers are. I know your sponsors are. If you've got somebody in your life that's that, that centering in your gut, look at it. Who have you been unable to forgive? How much time do you spend obsessing about somebody else, somebody who's done you wrong, somebody who maybe it's a boss you don't get along with or a coworker? How much time do you spend obsessing about other people? Um, Are you waiting for anyone to make amends to you first? Have you avoided events or places because you don't want to run into somebody? You know, is there, you know, are you going to meetings on the other side of town because you don't want to run into that person you were in relationship with? You know, is there, is there some, is something that your resentment has caused you not to go to your reunions or uh, family reunions or Christmas or whatever? Um, who gets the brunt of your anger? For me, it's usually people that I think are safe. When I'm not being very kind to service people, when I'm being mad to, at the checkout person at the Kroger, I have work to do. You know, that's, that's uh, something that I see happen for me. Some of the things that I've seen that particularly help when it comes to looking at making amends is practical exercises, um, practical things that we can do. Uh, if you don't have a guide box, get one. You know, write the name down of the person that you're struggling to forgive or that you wish that would forgive you and put it in a God box. I've done this a number of times. I have um, many people that I've sponsored that I have write down the name of the person that they're struggling with the most and get rid of that name somehow every day. If it depends on how much they resent them. I've had them write it on toilet paper and use it, but um, I've had them... I've had... I don't tell them, they just do it, and they tell me later what they do. I've had people, you know, I think this one's kind of gross, but spell it out in alphabet soup and eat it. I don't know about that one. It's kind of gross. But, you know, I've had people um, burn them. I've had people throw them away every day. I've had, I had a girl recently write it on eggs every day and go throw the eggs at trees. Um, 
But there was something about the act of writing it down and getting ready, rid of it. She did the anger thing two or three times, and the fact that every day she was act, actively praying that God would help her get rid of that anger, that resentment, that pretty soon she was writing it down and burying it. And then she was writing it down and attaching it to a heel and balloon. You know? And then it was gone. And this girl's name was Karen. And she was the first funeral I did this year. The three days before she three days before she died, and she died very, very early in life. She was fifty six. She had a pulmonary embolism. Three days before she died, we were talking on the phone. She said, You know, I don't resent my mother anymore. Three days. Um, when I was working on this talk, I was um, listening, reading a lot, and I was listening to a CD of my wonderful friend, Ed Meadham, and I miss him a lot. He was really my, my minister. And um, if, you don't, if you've never heard Ed's story, I'm sure that Lee has it back then, back there, so get a copy of it. But um, Ed was kind of a thug when he first got sober, you know. And um, from there, he, a lot of things happened. He ended up being the manager of the Harlem Globetrotters for a while. And he got led to be called into the ministry. Now, before that time, early on, when he was early sober, his father was an active alcoholic, and he had just said goodbye to his father and gone to a meeting, and his father was murdered in a bar. And... Um, when Ed became a minister, he was one day speaking on forgiveness from the pulpit. And um, he said, you know, I can't talk about this topic anymore until I forgive the man that murdered my father. And so he started praying for the man. And he had an opportunity to testify on behalf of the man that murdered his father at the parole hearing. This man had gotten sober in prison. So he went and spoke on his behalf, and the parole board said, We'll only release him if we release him to you. So the man that murdered his father, he allowed to move in with him. Now you talk about a forgiveness story. Ed had one. And he actually later on, not just speaking in AA, later, later spoke with the Dalai Lama, you know, he, about forgiveness. Um, one of us who was able to use these steps to transform his life. If Ed can forgive the man that murdered his father, I think of that often, then those little petty resentments I hold on to, I can surely let go. Why do we do it? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom of bondage. You know, freedom to sleep at night. The promises of AA, the, prom- the, the gifts of al that we're not really supposed to call them that. Um, the renewed relationships. Think about the people you'd like to have renewed to your life. I can say that, you know, I'm at peace with all the members of my family today. I've been able to do that work. I have two girls that for whatever reason, they got a chip on their shoulder about me. One of them, and they're not in the program. One of them is very happy to say she has implacable resentment and she will never forgive me. And I, have, I continue to send her cards and do little things for her. And maybe she'll never forgive me. I, when it comes to that relationship, I'm still standing in the middle of the street. There are those times that we just have to let something go and do the best we can. But I'm still going to do my part. And I have done my part, and so I can sleep at night. You know. I thank you for letting me share with you today, and I thank you and... Uh, for allowing me to share a little bit with you about my gift of forgiveness. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 